And I want us to talk a bit about the neuroscientific basis for mindfulness. I mean, how much evidence is there now about how practicing mindfulness regularly changes the brain? What, what sort of things can you see? Yeah, well, there's a, I mean, I would sort of describe it as a, a, a growing but fascinating uh, body of work using different sorts of neuroimaging techniques to probe what happens to the brain when you're training in mindfulness or other sorts of meditation. I mean, even from the 70s, there was a literature on kind of meditation more broadly and changes in the brain. But more specifically now, people are evaluating MBSR and specifically mindfulness, working both with very, very experienced practitioners, i.e. monks with, you know, 50,000 hours of practice, uh, all the way down to kind of, you know, Joe Public that's done eight weeks training um, and had some scans pre and post. And as Ruby said, you know, a core aspect of what you need to do that there's no getting around is that you need to train attention. So, you know, we find that if we look at the attention areas of the brain, and it's a, you know, a distributed uh, attention network, but quite a lot going on in the frontal lobe, uh, there are structural and functional changes in, in these regions of the brain. Uh, so typically it might be that there's more grey matter uh, and when people are doing tasks they're actually using the brain in a different way that's more efficient. And is that permanent? Are those changes permanent even if they stop practicing yeah, regularly? I think from an evidence-based point of view in terms of general public doing this we don't probably have the answer to that but if we stick with the gym analogy uh, if you've done a bit of gym and then you stop and you go back to it, you can probably pick it up a little bit more easily. So it's probably unlikely that it completely disappears and you can become 100% unmindful. Um, if you went back to it, you, you might pick it up a bit more quickly. Now, there's but good you're more primed. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, you're, it becomes more habit forming. Yeah. So that's, that's that gray matter is that, um, you know, that you make more and more connections and that's how you get smart. You know, that's like building up um, your pecs. That's what that gray matter is. It's not just gray matter. It's like more neural connections. And the more intrinsic, you know, the more complicated they're relate they are, the thicker they are, the more, um, it's, it, the, more the, the more information you have. But they so use you have a more uh, flexible mind rather than a rigid one. They sort of use the analogy of a path, maybe. So if you're practicing... You know, you're kind of cutting the path with the machete and you're, you're making the path well-worn. And then maybe you stop practicing and a little bit, the bushes are growing back and it's kind of a little bit more difficult to get through. But if you then put the effort again, actually there is still a track there. And, and, you can and there's good evidence that it can be effective for people with depression. But I don't know what you think, Ruby, about just looking for the neuroscientific evidence. Does that add something to that? I mean, if people say they feel better and they feel better, do we, do we need to then see what's reflected in their brains as well? Is, is that useful? It's only useful when you're not depressed. When you're depressed, I wouldn't do therapy, at, or I just hit the medication. So um, it depends w where you are. If you're out of it, yeah, I like seeing the evidence and saying, I mean, there is evidence that if you have more than three episodes, the, um, it's, it's cognitive, and um, I think mindfulness have a record of, of having the least um, relapses if you practice mindfulness. Yes. You have less relapse and even cognitive therapy. Yeah. But I'm, I mean, and also I'd someday like to get off of medication. Um, so I'm yeah, sort of trying year. to build up a six pack so that I can, but I might not be the type that can, so I'm ready to go back on it. But I've been on it for 20 years. And what is it that fascinates you about the neuroscientific evidence? What is it that you like being able to Well, to I like see? that when I'm sitting there focusing, I, I kind of can picture, you know, that there's this area um, that decouples. You know, there's an area that, that motivates you. I think it's the busy mind, that ACC, you know, it does, but anyway, it makes you go, which is good. But if it goes too much, you're only in the habit of that pushing, you know, pushing. So um, when you do practice, there's a kind of decoupling of the frontal cortex. That means you have a stopping system. It goes, wait, wait, but not in a kind of, uh, you're repressing anything. I'm just strengthening strengthening that ability to be able to pull apart. Come on, Ruby, get up. It's, you're disciplining yourself to not, what is that, 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 that when they teach kids not to um, take the sugar right away? 
yeah, 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 inhibition, inhibition networks. Yeah. In, inhibition networks, so that I'm not always at the mercy. I've got to make, sometimes when I'm meditating, I find my hand on my iPhone. You know, and, and there's a battle going on. I want that iPhone more than anything in the world because I have to call somebody to paint my nails. You know what I mean? It's not my house wasn't on fire. So just by the watching, then you gradually, I'll still go back to it, you know, but it's like I almost see how, many, how long I can wait. And the waiting is the strength, and the waiting has to do with also the discipline when the depression comes. I won't fall right in it. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah. Or is this Melbourne yeah. And, and why talking? do you think that, that mindfulness helps with depression? Or what is it about it? What I liked in Ruby's example was the way that she was using her hands to kind of show what, what her brain was doing. And one study that, that I've really been influenced by in terms of my thinking is one that's shown that when we're in this mindful mode, which is this observing, gentle observing, rather than kind of caught up in the tsunami, as you say, of the affect, actually it's a more lateral region of the frontal cortex that becomes more activated. So, so literally, if you're saying, I'm, I'm observing, you know, actually you are activating a more lateral um, part of the brain. But what that study showed, which was interesting, was that following the mindfulness training, um, they also looked at the coupling of frontal lobe with a region of the brain that codes for interoceptive awareness. So these are the body cues, is obviously my main area of interest. And, you know, if you felt sad or angry or had a strong emotion, you know, some people might feel it in their head, but mostly we're feeling it here. You know, it's that <clears throat> feeling, you know, it's in the body. So we might imagine that somewhere in the brain that's being encoded. And when that hits, in the habitual mode, we just want to get away from it because the brain goes, bad feeling, get away, get away, get away. And actually, we know that this more medial, what we call the it's all about me bit of brain gets activated because it has to be for survival reasons. And so before mindfulness training, it's all about me and the body centers are tightly coupled. But after mindfulness training, that coupling is reduced. And there's increased coupling between body regions and this more lateral observer position. So for me, that tells a nice story that says, you know, when we're not trained, actually we get overwhelmed by what we're feeling and we just kind of fall into this pattern of like struggle and trying to get out of it. But after mindfulness training, we are able to sit and say, oh, okay, what I'm noticing is my heart beating fast and my hands are sweating and yeah, okay, that, that could be anxiety. That's okay. It's, I'm not going to die, I'm just observing, and you know, don't be kind to yourself, it's okay to be anxious on a stage in front of loads of people, that's okay. But will I let it overwhelm me so that I can't speak clearly and communicate? Because I'm also thinking of my butt on the chair right now, then no. 